Sally, and I'm here with you for another edition of Battle Bits. The chapter we're reading today is from the book Orphan Train Girl by Christina Baker Klein. So this is chapter one of Orphan Train Girl. Chapter one, Molly, Spruce Harbor, Maine, present day. Well, Jack's mom says from the driver's seat, this is it. Molly, sitting next to Jack in the back seat of the car, eyes the house. Three full stories, more windows than she can count. Car carved curly cues around the roof. The white paint is fresh and gleaming. This is the house where Jack's mom works for a rich old lady. And now Molly is, maybe, going to work for that rich old lady too. All because she stole a book. Well, she didn't actually steal it, although it's true she was going to. Molly had been in the Spruce Harbor Public Library on her knees in the fiction section with three copies of The Secret Garden on the shelf in front of her. She'd pulled all three copies off the shelf, put the hardcover back, then the newer paperback too. The one she kept was old and dog-eared, the cover missing a corner, the yellowed pages beginning to come loose from the cheap binding. She figured nobody would miss it, and she slipped it into her backpack. But when Molly put the backpack over her shoulders and stood up, the librarian, Mrs. LeBlanc, swooped down on her like a homing pigeon. She called Ralph and Dina, Molly's foster parents. Dina hit the roof. Molly had way too many problems, she said. She never signed up for this, she said. Ralph calmed her down and called Lori, Molly's social worker. Why in the world would you try to steal an old book? Lori asked Molly. I don't know, Molly said, but that wasn't entirely true. The Secret Garden is all about a girl who has to leave her home and travel to a cold, rainy place where nobody wants her. A girl who scowls and sulks and says horrible things and still ends up with a home, a mansion actually, and a family. Lori came up with a plan for Molly to do 20 hours of community service. Dina grudgingly agreed that Molly could stay as long as she finished her hours. And Jack, who was the best friend Molly's ever had, heard his mom grumbling about needing to help Mrs. Daly clean out her attic and came up with the idea for Molly to do it instead. If Mrs. Daly likes Molly, if she says yes. Molly thinks it might have been simpler just to let Dina kick her out. Okay, Jack says quickly, here's the deal. Mrs. Daly's okay for an old lady, but kind of old fashioned. His mom pivots to look at Molly. What Jack means is you need to mind your manners, don't slouch, say please and thank you. What I mean is she's kind of uptight, Jack says. How old is she again, Molly mumbles. I don't know, pretty old. Come on, you two, his mom says. Might as well get this over with. She gets out of the car and heads up the walk towards the house. Molly is suddenly nervous. She looks down at her too big pink blouse and attempts to tuck it into her skirt. The blouse is Dina's. She insisted Molly borrow it, saying it would be disrespectful for Ms. to Mrs. Daly to wear her usual black t-shirt over black jeans over worn out black tennis shoes. Maybe if you look a little more respectable, Mrs. Daly will overlook that blue streak in your hair, Dina said. Jack opens his car door, then hesitates. He leans toward Molly. Listen, mom didn't tell her about you stealing the book. Molly twitches in her, sheet, in her seat. She didn't? No, just that you have to do a community service project. She thinks it's for school, like everybody has to do one. He says, got it? Then he bounds out of the car and waits for Molly on the driveway. Molly slides out more slowly. So this rich lady doesn't know that Molly is a thief. That's good, right? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe it means that Mrs. Daly will expect Molly to be what she definitely isn't, just like every other kid. Gloomily, Molly, Molly follows Jack up the walk. It's one of those rare days when spring in Maine actually feels like spring, but even the warm April sun doesn't help her mood. Just nod and smile. That's what I do when I have to talk to her, Jack whispers as they climb the porch steps. Molly feels like she is shrinking inside herself, getting smaller with each step as she follows Jack's mom inside and down a long hall. She tugs at the collar of the stupid pink blouse, thinking about the scene in the secret garden where Mary Lennox arrives at Misselthwaite Manor. When Mary got there, her uncle insisted that she get rid of all her dark clothes. 
I won't have a child dressed in black wandering about like a lost soul, he said. Molly feels like a fake in this outfit, and a bad fake at that. When was the last time she wore something pink or a blouse with a collar? At the end of the hallway is a closed door. Jack's mom pauses before it and knocks softly. Vivian, she opens the door a crack. All right for us to come in? Molly hears the faint reply beyond the door. Why, certainly. Jack's mom opens the door wider and Molly and Jack follow her into a large sunny living room. The wide windows are filled with the bright restless blue of the sea. Sitting in a red wingback chair, wearing a snug cream colored sweater that looks as soft as a kitten's fur is an old lady, the old lady, the one who owns this giant house. Good morning, the old lady says. Good morning, Jack's mom says. Vivian, you know my son, Jack. He lifts his hand in a small wave. Nice to see you, Mrs. Daly. And this is the girl I told you about, Molly Ayer. She gestures at Molly to step forward. Molly, this is Mrs. Daly, she says. Nod and smile, Molly thinks. She nods and smiles and holds out her hand for Mrs. Daly to take. The old woman's hand is dry and cool. Nice to meet you, Molly, she says. All right then, I have some things to do in the kitchen, Jack's mother says. Jack, why don't you come with me? Can't I stay and I could use some help. Jack trails after his mother, casting a glance back at Molly that is probably meant to be encouraging. Now Molly and Mrs. Daly are alone. Mrs. Daly leans forward a little in her chair. She looks at Molly with interest. Molly fights an urge to start babbling. She'd like to explain to Mrs. Daly that Jack came up with this terrible idea and then asked his mom. Although Molly doesn't know that much about real moms, moms who actually take care of their kids, she can tell that his mom doesn't say no to Jack. Not much, not when it's something he really wants. And so Molly's here. But now that Mrs. Daly has seen Molly, has seen the blue streak in her dark hair and the look on her face, Molly's trying not to have that look on her face, but it's there, she can feel it. They can all quit pretending that Molly is the kind of kid who does community service in people's attics, and she can just go, like always. How on earth did you achieve that effect? The blue stripe, Mrs. Daly asks. She reaches up and brushes the hair at her own temple. Smile and nod. But Mrs. Daly has asked her a question, so Molly has to answer. Um, I separated out this one part and bleached it, then I went back and dyed it blue. How did you learn to do it? I saw a video on YouTube. YouTube? On the internet? Ah, Mrs. Daly lifts her chin. The computer. I'm too old for such fads. Molly blinks again. This old lady doesn't have a computer? She's never heard of YouTube? Mrs. Daly leans back in her chair. Excuse my bluntness, but at my age, there's no point beating around the bush. Your hair and your fingernails. Molly glances down at her fingernails. She left most of the thrift store rings at home, but she kind of forgot about the chipped black polish. You borrowed that blouse, I assume. Uh, you needn't have bothered. It doesn't suit you. She waves a hand, which Molly takes to mean that she can sit down. She picks a matching armchair across from Mrs. Daly and perches on the edge of the seat cushion. By the way, you can call me Vivian. I never liked Mrs. Daly. My husband is dead, you know. Molly nods, a little surprised at how blunt the old woman is. I'm sorry. No need to be sorry. It was eight years ago. Anyway, I am in my 90s. Not many people I once knew are still alive. Molly isn't sure what she's supposed to say to this. Sorry again, or of course not. Maybe, wow? She just nods once more and makes a mental note to tell Jack that Mrs. Daly, Vivian, is close to a century old. She wouldn't have guessed, but then she hasn't known many elder, elderly people to compare. The only grandmother she can remember died of cancer when Molly was three. Terry tells me you're in foster care, Vivian says. Are you an orphan? Molly lets her gaze slide from Vivian's face to the bright sunlight and shimmering water on the other side of the windows. My mom's alive, but yes, I call myself an orphan. Why? Vivian doesn't sound as if she's particularly sorry for Molly, or horrified, or weirdly intrigued the way people can be when they find out about Molly's family. Molly's memory, memories of her mother are a little hazy. When she thinks back, she can recall the smell of their trailer, mildew and cigarette smoke, the way the TV seemed to be on all the time. 
She remembers pulling open the refrigerator door when it was still big and heavy to her and rummaging inside to find things to eat. Cold hot dogs, maybe some leftover pizza. She'd do that whenever her mother was at work and sometimes even when she was at home. I think if you don't have parents who take care of you, you can call yourself whatever you want, Molly says. There's a pause. Then Vivian says, fair enough, tell me about yourself. Molly has lived in Maine her entire life. She's never even crossed the straight state line. She remembers bits and pieces of when she was a little kid on the reservation on Indian Island, the community center with pickups parked all around, Sock Alexis Bingo Palace, St. Anne's Church. She remembers the corn husk doll her dad gave her with black yarn hair and moccasins and a long fringed dress that she kept on a shelf in her room. The truth is she would have preferred a Barbie like the ones donated by charities and doled out at the community center around Christmas. They were never the popular ones like Beauty Queen Barbie or Cinderella Barbie. Instead, they were the kind you find on clearance at Walmart, Hot Rod Barbie, Jungle Barbie. But Vivian doesn't want to hear about toys. Where should Molly start? She knows by now that people don't want to hear everything. There's a lot they'd rather not know and a lot she'd rather not tell. Well, she picks a bit of nail polish off one finger. I'm a Penobscot Indian on my father's side. When I was young, we lived on a reservation near Old Town. She tells the rest of the story in a few sentences. Her mom and dad couldn't take care of her, so she ended up with Ralph and Dina. She doesn't mention the car crash that killed her father, how her mom got worse and worse after he died until the caseworker stepped in. There weren't any foster families on the reservation who could take her, so she ended up getting shuffled around before landing with Ralph and Dina. Terry tells me you were assigned some kind of community service project, Vivian says. Terry? Oh, Molly realizes, Jack's mom. And she came up with the brilliant idea for you to help clean out my attic. Seems like a bad bargain for you. There's nothing you'd rather do? Molly shrugs again. I like organizing things. Then you are even stranger than you appear, Vivian says with a smile. Normally, Molly would be offended, but for some reason she isn't. Is it because there's nothing in Vivian's voice to show that she thinks strange is the same thing as bad? Not like the girls at school, the way they look at Molly and whisper weird. Vivian only seems amused by the idea of a sixth grader who likes to tidy things. Leaning forward in her chair, Vivian says, I'll tell you something. By your definition, I'm an orphan too, so we have that in common. Molly isn't sure how to answer. She's never met a grown-up who talks about being an orphan. Don't you have to be a kid to be an orphan? But she has to admit that she's curious. Your parents, she asks hesitantly, watching Vivian's face carefully for a sign that she's saying the wrong thing. They didn't take care of you? They tried. There was a fire. Vivian shakes her head. It was all so long ago, I barely remember. Neve, New York City, 1929. Neve was seven years old when her family took a berth on a ship called the Agnes Pauline, bound for Ellis Island. As Neve stood on the lower deck outside the dark, cramped rooms, watching the oily water churn beneath the ship, her spirits filled with hope. People from their village in County Galway were always fleeing to America. In Ireland, potatoes rotted in the fields and children cried from hunger. Many young men in the village went off to fight the British. Some came back wounded or grimly silent. Some didn't come back at all. But in America, people said, there were oranges the size of potatoes, fields of grain waving under sunny skies, houses with water running from faucets and even electric lights. Neve wasn't sure all that was true, but she hoped they would at least find a better life once they arrived. What they found were the grimy streets of Lower Manhattan, a dishwashing job for Da at the pub, and a small apartment on Elizabeth Street for $10 a month. There was a bedroom for Neve and her brother and sister, an even smaller one for Mom and Da, a kitchen and a parlor. There was indeed a weak electric light that Neve could pull on with a chain and a small stained sink where cold water ran from a fountain. Outside in the hall, there was a toilet, one they shared with their neighbors downstairs, an elderly German couple called the Schatzmans. Da's paycheck from the pub was barely enough to feed all four children, and Ma seemed listless much of the time. And it was hard to get used to the great crowds of people, all speaking different languages. Surely there were more people on Elizabeth Street than in their entire village back in Ireland. 
Some of them twisted up their faces or spat in disgust as soon as Neve opened her mouth and her Irish voice tumbled out. Even with all of this, she felt hope. It was a chance for a new beginning. And that is chapter one of Orphan Train Girl. Thank you for joining me. See you next time.